How's it going, guys? So this is a past level basic question for Repro Pathophys for step one. You need to know this mechanism going into your exam. No fucking excuses. If you're studying for step two and this question gives you issues, you're going to have serious fucking problems in your exam, okay? Allow me to be a fear-mongering asshole, but this is hyper basic. You need to know this. So before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Give the video a like. Really appreciate it. Find me on Instagram, melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. The link is down below. Find me on Telegram, recently created a Telegram group and channel. Links are down below. Now let's start the question. 31-year-old woman, she she's had irregular menses for the past year, ranging between 21 55 days in length. Last menstrual period was two weeks ago, means she's not pregnant. BMI elevated at 29, should be 18.5 to 25. Question is just asking what's most likely to be seen. Now look, you need to know for USMLE that elevated BMI in a woman who has irregular menses is an ovulation until proven otherwise. Now the only tricky component I could potentially articulate is that anovulation and polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, are on the same spectrum. The mechanism is the same. We only call anovulation PCOS when it's so severe that we now have hirsutism. And 11 cysts visualized as per uh, ovarian ultrasound bilaterally uh, with regard to the Amsterdam criteria, but USMLE is not going to fucking assess that. You just need to know anovulation plus hirsutism is PCOS. Some students will look at this vignette and say, oh, that's PCOS. Not technically PCOS. We don't have hirsutism here, but it is anovulation. It is high BMI plus irregular menses. So high BMI causes insulin resistance, which leads to abnormal GnRH pulsation, which causes an increase in the LH to FSH ratio. Now, LH is the hormone that will surge slash spike and ultimately trigger ovulation. LH is high. And it's safe to say that when that, that because FSH is low, our follicles are not stimulated as well as they should be. So by the time LH triggers ovulation, the underdeveloped follicles, we're not going to get a graphene follicle that ruptures, leading to a corpus luteum. So that follicle will be retained as a cyst. The corpus luteum normally secretes progesterone in the second half of the menstrual cycle, the luteal slash secretory phase. Now, let's just go through the answers here. I will clarify a bit more. Choice A, decreased corpus luteum secretion of HCG, wrong fucking answer. I mean, although we are not going to get a corpus luteum because we don't have ovulation, as I just fucking said, graphene follicles should rupture, become a corpus luteum that secretes progesterone. We're not getting that. So the first part sounds right. You're like, oh yeah, there's a there's going to be decreased corpus luteum uh, secreting something, but not HCG. We don't have a fucking placenta, okay? You need a placenta. You need to be pregnant to secrete HCG, all right? So immediately choice A, wrong fucking answer. Choice B, decreased in cystiotrophoblastic secretion of progesterone makes no sense. We don't, we're not pregnant here, okay? So this is what I'm doing, just throwing around some buzzy terminology for some of you guys early in your step one prep where you're, you're just not sure. You don't, you're only going to get a syncytiotrophoblast if you're pregnant, okay? And this is what's going to secrete HCG. The role of HCG during pregnancy secreted by the syncytiotrophoblast is to maintain the corpus luteum, which in turn secretes the progesterone to maintain the endometrial lining, okay? And HCG will peak at 8 to 10 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, after 10 weeks, the placenta will take over production of progesterone. Therefore, we don't need a corpus luteum. And therefore, we don't need HCG anymore to maintain that corpus luteum. Choice C, decreased follicular phase progesterone, wrong fucking answer, because progesterone is only going to be produced by the corpus luteum starting at the at ovulation, which is the onset of the luteal slash secretory phase. So whilst we do have decreased progesterone secretion in anovulation slash PCOS, it's not with regard to the follicular phase. Okay, the first half of the menstrual cycle, the follicular slash proliferative phase, we expect progesterone to be low anyway. We haven't ovulated yet. So this isn't anything unique to anovulation. Choice D, increased uh, serum FSH. Wrong fucking answer. As I just mentioned before, FSH is low in, in anovulation slash PCOS. It's an increase in the LH to FSH ratio. Some students will say, oh, but aren't like both increased, but it's just the ratio where LH increases more than FSH. No, okay? So LH is an up arrow, FSH is a down arrow, and then if you have the ratio, it's also an up arrow. Choice C, proliferative endometrium is the correct answer. Super fucking high yield, okay? This is past level, super high yield. You need to know estrogen stimulates endometrial lining. Progesterone maintains the endometrial lining, but also plays the role of capping off 
slash limiting the amount of proliferation that estrogen can induce. So when we don't ovulate and we don't form a corpus luteum and we don't get luteal phase secretion of progesterone uh, as a normal menstrual cycle, we're going to have what's called unopposed estrogen. Okay, This can cause endometrial hyperplasia, increases the risk for endometrial cancer later in life. Super fucking high yield, okay? They, on 2CK questions, they can just say, woman who's 55, who's overweight, and she has vaginal bleeding, and you just have, and she's, let's say, peri or postmenopausal, and you just have to know right away that's endometrial cancer. They basically cut out six steps. High BMI is this whole mechanism we just talked about, okay? Insulin resistance, abnormal generation pulsation, high LH-FSH ratio, and then you're not getting corpus luteum, and then you're getting unopposed estrogen, uh, endometrial hyperplasia, and that that's occurred earlier in life, can lead to endometrial cancer, okay? So super high yield that you know, uh, increased risk of endometrial cancer in patients who have anovulation. You know the deal. I'm going to continue making more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel, and I appreciate your time. That's it.